On September 11th, we learned that four passenger planes were hijacked and taken radically off course. Within an hour, two of the planes had flown into the enormous steel towers of the World Trade Center, creating fires and eventually toppling them. Dazed by the news, the American public soon believed the fires in the towers had burned so hot they caused the steel frames of the buildings to give way. A myth developed, fed by official sources through the media to a bewildered audience. So what was the task again? He admitted elements of the myth. The impact of the airplanes, gallons of burning jet fuel, steel melting, the buildings failing and suddenly imploding. In a mere 10 seconds, 110 stories hurtled earthward, pulverizing into dust. Right from the start, on the street itself, the official story was born. Come out of nowhere and just Scream right into the side of the Twin Tower, exploding through the other side. And then I witnessed both towers collapse, one first and then the second, mostly due to structural failure because the fire was just too intense. The myth bled into the FEMA report and was echoed by the experts. It was the combination of the impact load doing great damage to the building followed by the fire that caused collapse. John Skilling and Les Robertson were the structural engineers who designed the streamlined steel frames of the Twin Towers in the 1960s. Because a wayward army bomber flew into the Empire State Building in 1945, the towers were built with skyscraper crashes in mind. The airplane we were envisioning was the largest airplane of its time, flying slowly and low, lost in the fog. We designed the buildings to take the impact of the Boeing 707 uh, hitting the building at any location. But the aircraft that hit the towers was a Boeing 767, heavier than a 707, fueled for a transcontinental flight and traveling fast. 707s and 767s are comparable. The maximum takeoff weight of a fully loaded 707 is almost 334,000 pounds. As airplanes only carry the fuel load they need, the smaller model 767s that struck the towers were not, in actuality, maximally fueled or close to their maximum takeoff weight. As to the fires, listen to Chief Oreo Palmer from his radio on the South Tower's 78th floor. We got two isolated pockets of fire. We should be able to knock it down with two lines. Where you going? Where you going? 78th floor. We got two isolated pockets of fire. We got two isolated, pockets of fire. isolated pockets of fire. Two water lines to knock them down. FEMA's executive summary relays that much of the fuel in the planes jet-grade kerosene was consumed by the initial fireballs and the following few minutes of fire. It then tells us that the burning jet fuel spread between floors and ignited the building's contents, causing more fire and generating heat. This was somehow enough to bring down the tower's 47-column steel core, 236 exterior columns, and thousands of steel trusses all at the same time. Watch the tower smoking in the aftermath of the plane strikes. If you have ever tried to light a wood fire, you will know that smoking logs tell you the fire is not burning successfully. Smoke is the sign of an oxygen-starved fire. The Twin Towers stood for over an hour, smoldering but not flaming. During that time, thousands of people were evacuated by way of the stairwells. Others, trapped by debris, stood in the smoke-filled windows and signaled for help. 
In fact, the towers did what they were built to do. The building was designed to have a fully loaded 707 crash into it. That was the largest plane at the time. I believe that the building probably could sustain multiple impacts of jetliners because this structure is like the mosquito netting on your screen door, this intense grid. And the jet plane is just a pencil puncturing that screen netting. It really does nothing to the screen netting. The towers were built to withstand 140 mile an hour gusts produced by winter storms. Anyone in them on a windy day could feel them swaying. The single impact of a jetliner was no more of a blow than the continued battering of a hurricane. I was just putting my stuff away and all of a sudden we heard a loud crash and uh, the building started shaking, kind of moving like a wave. New Yorkers were stunned one hour later when the first tower fell. To the best of my knowledge, the considerations of the fuel in the airplane in terms of, a, of, a, of an explosion or a great fire was not considered. Now, we, we were not responsible for that aspect of the design. Imagine building expressly for airplane impact but never thinking of the fuel. Never before in the history of the world has a steel building collapsed due to fire. I have not seen, until recently, a protected steel structure that has collapsed in a fire. True infernos have raged hot and long in steel-framed buildings, but not one of the buildings ever came down. In 1975, the World Trade Center's North Tower suffered a nighttime fire that flamed for three hours, spreading vertically from floor to floor. It burned twice as long as the fires of 9-11 without even a hint of a building collapse. In February 2005, the Windsor Tower in Madrid, a skyscraper undergoing reconstruction, sustained a 20-hour fire. This is what was left, a standing building strong enough to support a crane. Compare a 20-hour inferno to 90 minutes of smoke. Why are buildings made of steel? Strong, light and flexible, steel frames offer many advantages over wood and concrete, especially where skyscrapers are concerned. Steel makes big buildings relatively light, with tremendous load-bearing capacity. The upper floors won't crush the floors beneath them, and steel holds up better to weather and fire. Most skyscrapers are built on steel or concrete frames, which is a grid of columns and beams that goes all the way through the building. The World Trade Center was different. It was what engineers call a tube structure. It was a very, very strong mesh of steel that surrounded the exterior. Inside, there was the core, a rectangle of 47 columns made of four-inch thick steel at the base, thinning with increasing height. The cores combined might with ingenuity, anchoring the towers and allowing them to flex. Look at the size of this steel. Solid, prefabricated floor assemblies, welded metal floor pans placed on top of trusses both welded and bolted to the vertical frames. The story we were told. This rock-like steel grid gave way because fire warped the trusses, causing the bolts to fail. As the trusses sagged and fell, the floors dropped with them. In its 2002 documentary, Why the Towers Fell, PBS creates a video model. Once the trusses fail, 
the floors they were holding cascade down with a force too great to be withstood. The result is what's called a progressive collapse, as each floor pancakes down onto the one below. What remains standing? The tall, indestructible core. Why does PBS fail to explain the complete disappearance of the Twin Towers' cores? The official story's central thesis is based on heat, temperatures high enough to weaken steel. But people in the towers did not report such heat. Think about it. Neither steel, concrete, nor glass can burn. So what in those buildings could have burned to make such heat? How do these firefighters describe the collapse of the North Tower? We started running, floor by floor, it started popping out. It was, like, it was if, if, if they had detonated, de yeah, it was if they were planning yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. All the way down, I was watching it and running. And others give similar descriptions. At 10.30, I tried to leave the building, but as soon as I got outside, I heard a second explosion and another rumble, and more smoke, and more dust. And then a fire marshal came in and said we had to leave because if there was a third explosion, this building might not last. Like, it sounded like gunfire. You know, bang, 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 bang. And then, and then all of a sudden, three big explosions. Started walking down the stairs, we made it to the eighth floor. Big explosion. Blew us back into the eighth floor. Do you, do you know if it was an explosion or if it was a building collapse? To me, it sounded like, it, it, to me, it sounded like an explosion, but it was a huge explosion. Chief Albert Turry told me that he was here after the events that took place this morning. He tried to get his men out as quickly as he could, but he said that there was another explosion which took place. And then an hour after, there was another explosion in one of the towers here. So according to his theory, he thinks that there were actually devices that were planted in the building. Reports of bombs in the buildings, explosions. A CBS reporter to Dan Rather. But I was coming um, toward the World Trade Center looking for CBS crews and asked a firefighter if I, he saw any. All of a sudden, there was a roll, an explosion, and we could see coming at us a ball of flame stories high. Listen to the sound of a large explosion right before the South Tower begins to fall. This is as close as we can get to the base of the World Trade Center. You can see the firemen assemble here, the police officers, everybody. Sound reaches us after what we see. If the boom we just heard was the sound of the building collapsing, it would follow the collapse. Instead, the boom is heard before. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Bring it back. Let's consider the characteristics of steel. Steel is an alloy of iron containing added carbon for flexibility, workability, and strength. In the days of old, blacksmiths heated iron till it was red and pounded it for hours to form it. Horseshoes, knife blades, and plowshares were typical creations. Steel was introduced in the mid-1800s and by the end of the century, with the advent of the blast furnace, found widespread commercial use. A blast furnace is known as a controlled environment. High temperatures are reached as oxygen is pumped into a closed space. How and when does steel melt? Steel melts at temperatures of 2750 degrees Fahrenheit and above, attained only in a blast furnace or when a powerful incendiary such as thermite is used. Steel or any substance that is burned will never become hotter than the temperature of the fire or heat.